I'm World Cup champion Megan Klingenberg. Wondering who you should root for at the FIFA Women's World Cup? I'm hosting a new podcast, my new favorite, Pupalista, where I will introduce you to soccer's brightest stars and the causes they are championing. From the 22-year-old American phenom speaking out about student-athlete mental health. I try to just like approach everything with like you don't know what someone's going through. To the U.S. defender who travels to tournaments with her young son. Am I ever going to be able to run for five minutes straight? Check out my new favorite Futbolista wherever you listen to podcasts. Edit audio. Serena Worthington. I am from Chicago. Do you watch the WNBA? I do not. What would get you to watch a WNBA game? If it was really close to my house or if I had any cable television whatsoever. This is Rebound Revolution, a not-so-basketball podcast bringing you the revolutionary on and off the court happening in the WNBA. From queer baddies to history to ones to watch, join me, Money, as we get into it all. This week, I'm joined by Molly Kahlane, and we get into talking all things from gender equity and sports coverage, the changes that are happening in support for the W, and where to hang out after Liberty Games. You're seeing in the last, I'd say two to three years, especially these viewership trends are skyrocketing. It's fantastic. If you make it accessible and make it so people can watch, they will watch. On two of my go-to streaming platforms for watching TV, I have the ads version because I'm thrifty and the extra $3 a month just doesn't seem worth it to not see the advertisements. This means that in this skip ad or commercial-free landscape, I end up seeing way more commercials than most folks. And you know what I've noticed? I can count and probably name the WNBA players I've seen in ads. And I've also noticed that when I do see women or non-binary players in ads, not many are dark-skinned or Black. They're just not represented. Ads are so important because they invite athletes into our homes. I mean, how else do you become a household name? There are so many WNBA players who have used their social media presences to build like personal brands for themselves. But old school ad support is still lacking. I dream of a day when I can see a W player in ads for hair care products because how do they keep their hair so fly? Or even in travel commercials, since that's been such a big discussion in the league, give me the hilarious legroom commercial for an airline company. Gender equity in sports marketing and advertisement is essential in growing the league. If we want to see more teams and higher salaries for our favorite players, we need to see their faces. Well, thank you, Molly, so much for being here. I'm so excited because I listen to your podcast. So thank you for being here. (laughs) Thank you for listening. That's really flattering. So I appreciate that. Yes, of course. So I guess I'll start there then. How'd you get into sports writing and podcasting? Yeah, um, my title's senior TV reporter at Adweek. So I've been at Adweek for like two and a half years. So I write about streaming, connected TV. So the like Netflix, Disney, Hulu, all those guys. But I love sports. When I joined, the chief content officer at the time was a woman named Lisa Granistein. And she did this live bi-weekly format, 20 minutes, Ad Week's Most Powerful Women in Sports, where she would have an executive or an athlete come on for 20 minutes, take live questions. When she left Ad Week, she actually called me and I was very junior at the company at the time and said, I would love to give you Most Powerful Women in Sports. I was flattered. So I took over (laughs) kind of doing the bi-weekly. And then about a year ago, Adweek launched its podcast network. Mm -hmm. So we turned Most Powerful Women in Sports from a bi-weekly live format into a weekly podcast. This year, we rebranded it as Champions Champions of Change. Champions of Change, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, wanted to be more inclusive, um, more gender-inclusive language, still primarily focused on women and non-binary folks. So I've just always loved sports. And then in terms of sports writing, there's a nice overlap between TV and sports, especially when it comes to sports media. So it's Mm -hmm. writing about the WNBA going on ION or uh, the NWSL moving into primetime. And from there, I've just kind of started making a name for myself as somebody who writes about sports, especially women's sports. So teams and brands have started to come to me with partnerships. I love like making yourself the resource just because it's your passion. You know, it reminds me of Ari Chambers. Like, you know, it's like, oh, I'm really into this. And then it becomes your thing. 
Being compared to Ari Chambers is probably the biggest compliment you can give me. Um, <laughs> shout out to my girl, Ari. <laughs> yeah. So you cover so many different sports. Do you have a team? Like, who is your WNBA team? Uh, all of them. All 12. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm a Liberty season ticket holder. Chicago Sky are how I got into the W. Uh, so love them dearly. But I mean, I love all the teams. Like the mm-hmm. Aces are super fun. The Sparks this year are going to be great. The Wings. Mm-hmm. The love Wings. Love the Wings. I was going to uh, say, I haven't heard a lot of like buzz about the Wings, but hello. They have like mm-hmm. seven or eight draft picks. Yeah. Arike is going to have a breakout season, I believe. I mean, I love Veronica Burton. I say that all the time. Yeah. I think she's phenomenal. Mm-hmm. The Wings are a totally new team this season. Yeah. Do you have a favorite way to watch the game? Yeah. I mean, my favorite way to watch is in person. Um, Same. Second mm-hmm. favorite is getting a bar or a restaurant to put on a game if it's national Mm -hmm. and then watching everyone around me get involved in the game too because that's the best way to grow the game, right? Show people. And if I'm not watching it in person or with people, I'm watching it at home on my computer or TV, but with League Pass on Roku this year, that'll be a little easier. League Pass is on Roku this year? Mm Mm-hmm. You just gave me some information. More things I'm really curious about with your work is like the growth that is so needed in like the gender equity around media coverage. What do you see as like a possibility for gender equity and media coverage? I think something that you say a lot on your podcast is that women's sports only gets like 10 percent of sports coverage. It's actually a little less than that. It's about 5 percent. What? Which is... A bummer, but it's changing and we're seeing it starting to change. Thank you for referencing the podcast. Mm-hmm. So I do say that a lot because that's something I'm actively trying to change too, right? Mm-hmm. But I think there's people doing incredible work out there individually and as corporations and brands. So you brought up Ari Chambers. Mm-hmm. What she's doing with Highlighter and herself personally is incredible. But then you've got other sports writers like my friend Meredith Cash over at Insider. She does a lot of coverage around W and soccer specifically, but all sports, all women's sports. Mm -hmm. So I think you're seeing this effort individually, and you're also seeing other companies start to realize, like, you've got brands popping up, like, together. I think you're seeing the work individually, and then you're seeing people start to form media brands. And then on the other side of it, you're seeing companies that are starting to invest. Ally Financial is a big one. What Andrea Brimmer, their CMO, is doing, she's pledged a 50-50 media spend for Ally within the next five years, Mm -hmm. um, meaning they're going to invest 50% of their money in women's media coverage, women's sports. So that's why you're seeing more women's sports on ESPN. They did a deal with Disney. That's why you're seeing kind of Ally's name pop up everywhere. They're the ones that had the NWSL move into primetime on CBS for the first time. Mm -hmm. Then you've got brands like Buick, who are they're partnering with everybody and trying to make this happen. They had a huge presence at the NCAA Women's Championship this year. A brand like Aflac moved all its on-the-ground spend from the men's tournament into the women's Mm -hmm. because they recognize you're spending less money but getting just as much coverage. I mean, almost 12 million people watched the Women's Championship. It's a huge opportunity for brands, and they're starting to realize that. Okay, so you started to talk about like 12 million viewers to the NCAA Women's Championship game between Iowa and LSU this year. So the audience is growing. Is that what you're seeing? A thousand percent. I mean, so it peaked at almost 12 million, but it averaged 9.9 million. And that's not a primetime game. That's a Sunday afternoon. Yeah. 10 million people were watching on average on a Sunday afternoon on ABC. First time the game was ever on ABC. But yeah, you're seeing in the last... I'd say two to three years, especially, these viewership trends are skyrocketing. You're seeing it in Mm -hmm. soccer. You're seeing it in basketball. You're seeing it in softball. You're seeing it in volleyball. Mm -hmm. Gymnastics on ABC, college gymnastics, 1.1 million viewers on Mm -hmm. a Saturday. It's fantastic. And I think, and I say this a lot, it's almost like beating a dead horse, but if you make it accessible and make it so people can watch, Mm -hmm. they will watch. It's much harder when you have to, like you and I were talking about earlier, Mm -hmm. trying to watch a WNBA. When you're jumping through hoops and trying to find it, is it on Facebook? Is it on Twitter? Is it on Prime Video? Like, if you make it easy, people will watch. And that's Mm -hmm. what you'll see when the new app comes out. They've actually made it so the schedule, it'll have in big letters what network the games are on for the WNBA. So you can just easily find it. Mm -hmm. So I think you're going to see even more viewership this year, especially with how popular college basketball was. Yes. I think you're going to see that translate into the WNBA this year. People are going to want to see what Aaliyah Boston's up to. That's what I'm saying. People have their faves from college who go to the league and they want to be able to watch them. Do you see media companies also kind of shifting around noticing that the audience is growing? 
I do. How are they showing up differently than maybe in years before or seasons before? Yeah, it feels like every day now I'm getting a new email in my inbox about a new player that's partnered with a brand like Arika Ngumawali and State Farm. She did a commercial yeah. with Mark Cuban. That wouldn't have happened five mm-hmm. years ago. Mm-hmm. Think about like Asia Wilson partnering with Ruffles. All the players now dropping signature shoes. Yeah. That didn't happen five years ago. I tell this story too. Over Christmas, I was down um, in South Florida and I went to Dick's Sporting Goods to pick up sandals for my brothers because they're stupid and they forgot them when <laughs> they were going to South Florida. And I walk in and I see just women everywhere. Like the branding, like Candace Parker is everywhere. And oh, not just yeah. Candace. I'd say about half of the displays were women mm-hmm. athletes. Mm-hmm. Um, I left with a pair of Stewie ones. I, that was not what I went there for, but they were 50% off <laughs> oh, and I wanted them. You have to get the Stewies when they 50% off. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So like visibility is shifting. I'm thinking about players like Jonquel Jones, yeah. yes, who is also in New York now, have really been vocal, especially on Twitter, about the fact that despite being like super visible, I mean, Jonquel was MVP, right? It, great athletes mm-hmm. that sponsors have been kind of slow to partner with them. And you kind of talk about this, too, in, like, your writing. I'm thinking specifically about the article you did about Sylvia Fowles and Sue Bird retiring and the difference in coverage they got. Do you see that starting to shift, too? I hope so. I've started to see that shift. And I'm glad you brought up John Quell. Did you read that fantastic piece by Katie Barnes on ESPN a couple years ago? It's a long profile on John Quell. And part of it that really stood out to me was she talked about how she, like, had to miss training to go film a spot because it, she was very rarely offered brand partnerships. And this was a national mm-hmm. campaign. I cannot remember who it was with. But she got yeah. to say, like, it, it was her name. She was like, someone was like, thanks, John Quell, when she handed it to oh, him yes, something. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's I think fun. that's, um, is that State Farm, too? Oh, it was Jake from State Farm. <laughs> you have a better memory than me. And so mm-hmm. last year I did a cover story with Sue Bird and Sylvia Fowles. Mm-hmm. Talked to both of them. And we talked about kind of the difference in brand partnerships. Like, Sue has been approached by everyone and their mother for a partnership. Yeah, She's super. Yeah. Sylvia Fowles, equally as good of a player, right. should be just as recognizable. Doesn't. They were both incredibly candid with me about it. Mm-hmm. And Sylvia said something like, she talked about how disappointing it was. And she was like, what do I have to do to prove yeah. myself? Yeah. When I told Sue what Sylvia said, Sue literally just like took a big, deep breath and goes, mm-hmm. that's really, really upsetting to hear. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, Sylvia Fowles is like, what, three championships, Olympic gold Four, medals? Four. Yeah, it's like, what? Yeah. If you talk about, you know, the height of success in basketball, she has it. You know, she might still be the rebounding leader of the league. You know, is. like, what else does she have to do? Well, she is studying mortuary mm-hmm. science right now, and I hope she is living her best life. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. So something that I think about a lot is like things that feel like natural connections or like opportunities for W players to be spokes folks for. Do mm-hmm. you have any like, I don't know, dream partnerships that you see like between players and brands or players in like uh, commercial opportunities? I mean, so many, right? Mm-hmm. Like, and I think it's important for the players to have those authentic partnerships, like to yeah. find a brand that represents their values mm-hmm. or something they just enjoy. Like when Paige Beckers makes a bucket hat deal, like I'm going to be so excited for that one. <laughs> I think about back in the day with the three to see with like Elena Deladon, Brittany Griner and Skylar Diggins, like Skylar Diggins, I will always associate her with the sweatbands, you know, like, the, oh, yeah, like yeah. Head, and I'm like, why does she not have like a line of headbands or sweatbands? Cause I just felt like it was just iconic. Then I think about Diana Taurasi with the bun. I'm like signature bun. (laughs) I'm like, where are the Diana Taurasi scrunchies? You know, because that bun don't move. You know know what? I want to know what hair product she uses to keep it that slick. I feel like I want to know this about everybody. Like, how do you keep your hair that okay (laughs) for everything you're doing? Oh, you know what I was just talking about recently? Um, Angel Reese with LSU and her oh, yeah. eyelashes. What oh. eyelashes does that girl use that they stay on? They stay on. Uh, Dee Dee Richards in a makeup brand. Get her oh, that now. Yes, yeah. See, I feel like these just feel like obvious partnerships, you know? And I'm just a little shocked that we don't see more. I do see social media kind of as like a a place where players have at least become kind of like influencers 
and mm-hmm. kind of like making a name for themselves that way. But I feel like these like larger partnerships are so important because they make people household names. You know, I think there's a reason why people know Sue Bird and can name mm-hmm. Sue Bird versus a Sylvia Fowles who is like equally as talented and accomplished. I definitely agree too. And especially with like national TV spots, mm-hmm. you turn on the TV and you're going to see like a Sue Bird Corona commercial, a Sue Bird CarMax mm-hmm. commercial. If you think you haven't seen a Seabird commercial, you're wrong. You've seen one. Yeah. I think the one she did with Steph Curry was my favorite because it was hilarious. And they're like, oh, we have a a four-time champion here. And Steph Curry's like, oh, no, you know, I'm working on that four championships. They're like, oh, not you, Sue Bird. (laughs) Have you seen the Tamika Catchings Coke one? No. Oh, that one's really good. (laughs) It's like Lil Dicky is arguing with someone over who's the greatest stealer of all time, Uh like in steals. And they're like going back and forth. And then all of a sudden, Tamika comes, steals the Coke they're drinking. And she's like, no, mine. They're like, oh, it's Tamika catching. It's her. Jordan Poole is the best stealer ever. No, 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 no. Muggsy Bowes is the best ever. Take it. Huh. Don Staley, true pickpocket. Hey, Tamika. I think you just. Can you just order two? So I want to change gears a little bit and talk kind of about the salaries and sort of like pay disparities Mm -hmm. that we see with non-binary and women athletes. A lot of players, including stars like Sylvia Fowles, like Sue Birds, they play overseas because Mm -hmm. they don't earn like really huge salaries in the W compared to like the men's NBA, for example. And this is part of the reason why, you know, BG was in Russia I always say that that was like a workers' rights issue, too. This was a labor issue. How do you see, like, growing interest in the league kind of impacting salaries and other opportunities financially for players? Well, the league salary isn't going to change until the WNBA changes it because they have a salary cap. So, like, a WNBA rookie is going to make, like, a first-rounder is going to make around $70,000 a year, Mm -hmm. which is why you see so many players go overseas. Yeah. Um, and why you see so many people doing brand deals. But I think the opportunity with the increased media coverage and the increased interest from brands is a different opportunity for players to make more money and hopefully not have to go overseas. And then the development of domestic leagues, too, like Athletes Unlimited. So that's giving players a chance to stay stateside, yeah. um, still make money, still play. Mm-hmm. But yeah, no, the pay gap is, I think the max salary is something like, it's like 230. And then you're even seeing players like take less than that in order to stay with their team like Mm -hmm. Sue Bird took less than that last year to stay with Seattle yeah it always is like mind-boggling to me that franchise players like I think when you think of Seattle you think of Sue Bird right (laughs) that franchise Mm -hmm. players aren't offered or paid like max contract deals (laughs) and have to take less to stay with their teams because of a a cap Yeah. And so that's something I hopefully will see changed in the next negotiations. But who knows? So you mentioned Athletes Unlimited. And for the listeners, Athletes Unlimited is a really exciting brand new league. I think in like its second season with four different pro women's sports that have a totally different scoring system than the WNBA. And you can watch those games on YouTube. And I got to go to a few games in Dallas. Last season. Oh, that's so fun. Oh, my gosh. It was so fun. But tell me more about Athletes Unlimited and your, like, interest in it. I think what AU is doing is really cool, right? Like, basketball, I think, is their newest sport, but it's also one of the most popular. For basketball specifically, it's a great way for players to be able to play year-round, for them to be able to stay stateside. A great way to expose people to the league and the sport who might not have seen it before. Because it's, it's really fun, right? It's so fun. Yeah, it's a different yeah. team each week. Mm-hmm. Like, And I was talking about this with um, Sherry Kempf, who's at Athletes Unlimited. She's director of softball, and she was a pro softball player. Mm-hmm. Softball athletes don't peak until they're 27. So huh. when you're graduating, when you're 22, like you've still got five excellent years before you're even at your best. Things like Athletes Unlimited give you the chance to keep playing. Oh, wow. That's so different than basketball. I feel like the closer you get to 30 the more and more people start asking you about, like, what's after basketball. <laughs> people are constantly asking Candace what she's doing next. And she's like, basketball. I love Diana's answer. Where she's like, old people can dream. She's like, they're going to have to drag me off the court, okay? 
they will drag her off the court. That girl is the oldest player on the court and just signed a two year super max yeah. contract. She's not going anywhere. She's not going anywhere. I would not want to be the one to tell Diana she's retiring. Right, right. And she's still good. People talk to her as if, like, you know, she's on the decline. Like, Diana be trash talking and shooting with the best of them, okay? <laughs> when she broke the locker room door in Chicago after they lost the championship, that's one of my top five, like, favorite sports moments of all time. And I think the top one is when Chicago took it off the hinges and took the broken door on their victory parade with them. <laughs> Chicago, I love the, like, the pettiness, but also the humor from Chicago as a team and also the fans. I feel like Chicago fans, like, they, they mirror that. <laughs> so kind of, like, going in another direction, how do you see like the NCAA Women's Championship game, also adding to the growth of women's basketball on a larger scale. I think this year is going to be really telling. I'm hopeful. Maybe I'm being optimistic, but I think we're going to see a big growth here for the WNBA because college ball exploded this year, right? It's always been popular, but this year was something else. And I think... You've got players like Aaliyah Boston coming into the league. Mm -hmm. So people are going to want to follow that. Mm -hmm. And I think next year might be even bigger just with that draft, with that star power of Caitlin Clark. I think when Caitlin Clark comes into the W and like Angel Reese, she can do a year after Caitlin. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if she will or not. But if Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese are in the same draft. The same draft class? If they are, WNBA, watch out. (laughs) What do you think changed? Because... Same. Like, I went to Auburn, which is, like, a huge sports school in general, but basketball was definitely a moment on campus always. You know, I was there when Dewana Bonner was playing for Auburn. Yeah, and then I was at Syracuse, another big basketball school, and I just feel like there wasn't that much hype around the games, especially the women's games, you know? Like, I could go and sit courtside because, like, nobody is there. But you look at those NCAA games now, like especially SEC games, there's not an empty chair, right? It is packed out. Maybe it's like not a fair question to ask, but like what changed? <laughs> like what happened? Because the basketball has always been good. Yeah, I think a lot of things changed. From what I see, I think the biggest one is it got easier to watch. Mm. I think it's very simple in that way. But then there's obviously like a lot more around it to just like kind of the overall growth of women's sports. But I think it all does come down to making it accessible and making it so people can watch. That does sound simple, but also like, look at the shift that it created, right? Just make it easier to watch. And then promoting it more too, right? Mm -hmm. Like put like Caitlin Clark on ESPN's Twitter feed. Like people Mm -hmm. love it. Mm -hmm. Though also a lot of the time, don't read the comments on Twitter when ESPN posts women's sports. (laughs) But just... Getting those highlights out there, like the deal that Ally Financial and Disney just made with SportsCenter, a whole package around it. And you're going to see a lot of that with soccer, too. It goes back to what we were talking about earlier, the media coverage. If you're reading these names and seeing these names, like I have the Chicago Sun-Times in my bedroom framed that's got Candace Parker on the front of it for the championship. Like, make those names household names. Like, we hear about Steph Curry all the time. All the time. Yeah, like, I want to hear that about women's sports, Mm -hmm. and we're starting to see that. So I think that's also helping it grow, too. Yeah. Molly, I love that as like a a slogan or a chant, like make those names household names. (laughs) For real, because I think I haven't really followed the men's NBA since maybe high school, you know, like. I was a huge Carmelo Anthony fan, not why I went to Syracuse, but, (laughs) you know, I just love the WNBA a lot more. And I still know the names of, like, these star players, right, as someone who doesn't follow. And it's because they're constantly pushed, right? So it's like, I can't not know who Giannis Antetokounmpo is. You know, it's like, I can't not know uh, Ja Morant because... They're everywhere. It's like, how do I, <laughs> how do you escape it? Yeah. Yeah. I want to see that with W players too. I agree. And I also don't really follow the men's yeah. NBA. Like, I, I like the WNBA a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, part of it is for all the gay reasons. Like, <laughs> everybody is so fine. And just like, <laughs> oh my goodness. I also think like the energy is really different at a W game than at an NBA game. I've been to live games for both, and it just feels so, like, comfortable being a fan at the W games. 
Yeah, I walk into a Liberty game and I'm just like, I relax. I'm like, oh, I'm home. I'm here. <laughs> mm-hmm. I go to my seat. I have my popcorn. I have my beer. And I'm like, I know exactly what I'm about. And my seats are like eight rows behind the Liberty bench, too. <laughs> so it's like really, it's really fun. Like I hear Dee Dee talking her smack all the time. And it's so funny. <laughs> yeah. You know, they've been doing like mic'd up or wired the last few seasons. I'm like, yeah, I want to hear the bench talk. Okay. Run. And you'll get like five easy layups in this game. Well, I guess it's ain't a normal. Bang! Bang! I need Diana Bang! mic'd every game. Oh. I just that's I need that. <laughs> I, I think it would just be a series of bang, bang, like block, blocking out. <laughs> I will never forget when she told the ref during the wobble season, I'll see you in the lobby. (laughs) I was watching this game and also you can read her lips, right? It's just so obvious what she's saying. I think somebody was making free throws and she was standing next to Amani McGee Stafford and she said, tell your mom I said, hey, or something like that. And I'm like... (laughs) Like, (laughs) first of all, the fact that Diana has been playing long enough to play with Pamela McGee and Amani McGee Stafford. (laughs) And second of all, to be talking trash like, oh, yeah, tell your mama I said, what's up? Like, that (laughs) is hilarious. And, yeah, I'm waiting for, like, the the documentaries on Diana's trash talk. (laughs) Because I would watch an entire series of that. (laughs) Because you do so much, like, cross-league coverage, there's a lot of, like, interleague couples, too. You know, like, of course, the power couple, Sue Bird and Megan Rapinoe. Do you see, like, the leagues kind of bolstering each other when it comes to visibility? Yeah, I definitely think so. And Mm -hmm. I think Sue and Megan's a great example, too. Mm -hmm. Like, when Megan Rapinoe shows up at Storm Games, it's really exciting. And then I think... I mean, with Sue being retired, too, like, I think we might see some Sue and Megan appearances at a Liberty Games. Like, yeah. leagues can definitely bolster each other, too. Like, at the National Women's Soccer League Championship, I went and I met Alina Del Don. She went to the game. Like, oh my goodness. Yes. Yeah, so I definitely think the leagues can help build each other up in that way. Oh, my gosh. I can't imagine just, like, being in the stands and seeing Elena Del Don just chilling there. <laughs> I just kind of like turned to mush after the games too. And I'm like, I watched you as a kid. And that's that's like all that can come out. (laughs) Cause like the WNBA players are so accessible after the game. Um, Mm -hmm. And even like before the game, I'm thinking about like the Athletes Unlimited vibe where they're just kind of like walking around, their families in the crowd. So they're saying, hey, I'm watching Odyssey Sims chase her little one around. And I'm like, what is happening right now? Like I just made eye contact with Odyssey Sims. (laughs) (laughs) but no it's the same thing too even with liberty games like in a big city like new york there's a couple bars near barclays that the players just go to after the games so we'll see them and our little queer selves we go to the game um and then maybe we'll like do one drink at a bar nearby and then we always end up at ginger's the lesbian bar in park Mm -hmm. slope (laughs) and then you just see so many people that were already at the liberty game it's like it's a post-game party every time oh my gosh so ginger's is the post-game Ginger's the post okay. game. Yep. Got it. Because I got the home game package and I'm like, okay, I'm going to be there. I'll see you at Ginger's. So. Yes. Okay. I will see you I'll at see you Ginger's. at the game and I'll see you at Ginger's. Yes. <laughs> What opportunities or hopes do you have for like media coverage or like partnerships for W players moving forward? My dream is that. Every time I turn on the TV, there's a women's basketball game on. Mm. (laughs) Um, Mm. But yeah, I'm really hopeful for this season. And I've said that a couple of times, but I really do think the momentum from the NCAA season is going to carry into the WNBA. But yeah, in terms of my dream, I want more people to be watching. I want more games on ABC. I want more games on CBS. I want everyone to get where we are, where you and I Mm. already are. We know Mm -hmm. this game is great. We know it's super exciting. I want everyone else to see that too. Yeah. Molly, where can we find you? You can find me on Twitter. My handle is just my name, Molly K. Helene. Um, Instagram is Mol K. C. And then my podcast you can find on Apple, Spotify, anywhere you listen. It's called Champions of Change, Shattering Ceilings in Sports. And then you can read my work on adweek.com. All right, Molly. Well, that's all I have for you. You're just like a wealth of knowledge and information <laughs> on like women's sports 
in a global sense, but also women's basketball specifically. So thank you so much. Well, Money, thank you so much for having me on. Looking forward to seeing you at a game. Yes, I'm looking forward to seeing you too. I can't wait. Now let's get into Watch Them Work, where I spotlight a W team who deserves their flowers. These teams are killing the game, or maybe not so much, but regardless, this is where I'm going to gush about them and tell you why you should have your eyes on them. This week, I'm watching the Dallas Wings. So I'm really excited about the Dallas Wings. I know that the coastal teams get a lot of hype, but the Wings are holding it down in Texas, and I'm going to tell y'all three reasons why you should be excited for the Wings, too. So first off, the Dallas Wings are known for being one of the first WNBA expansion teams. They were originally in Detroit, and then they moved to Tulsa, and now they're North Texas's own team. They have been holding it down in Texas since the 2016-ish era, and you can't mention the Dallas Wings without mentioning Arike Agumbawale. She has become all the things that a franchise player needs to be for a team. She has not only been an incredible player, okay? The walk-in outfits are amazing. <laughs> Her presence has also been huge from all the philanthropic stuff that she's done to being at Athletes Unlimited Games when their season was in Dallas to being at the NCAA Women's Basketball Championship Games. You really can't mention Dallas basketball without mentioning Arike Ogunbowale. She wants to call Dallas home. She wants to be that franchise player, and I think she can do it. And lastly, why I think you should be hyped for the Dallas Wings is they have bigs who can handle the competition in the league. So these are players that can protect the basket, block shots from the other teams, and can also get the ball where it needs to be. I'm thinking about Tierra McCowan, who has not just been incredible in the W, but also overseas. Satu Sabali, who's probably going to end up playing her little sister at some point this season. <laughs> and Kalani Brown, who I love because she's not only a big who can block shots, but she's really good at assists. Watching her play in Athletes Unlimited was so exciting. And if you are not excited about any of the basketball parts of being a Dallas Wings fan, you should get excited about seeing them this season because they have one of the most fun social media presences in the league. They're a really young team, so they're always doing like these TikTok challenges or asking each other riddles on Instagram. They have just like a fun and inviting social media presence. And I encourage you to follow them on all the socials. So I'm really excited to watch the Dallas Wings. Who else do you think I should be watching? Let me know. Want to sound like you in the know when it comes to the W? I got you. This is Fun Dementals where I'll give you a rundown of something to make you look like you're the expert in the room. This week, we're talking about dimes. So picture it. You're watching a game on WNBA League Pass, and the announcer keeps talking about dimes. You don't see anybody dropping pocket change, so you're thoroughly confused. No worries, I got you. A dime is a prolific pass where one player gets the ball to a teammate in such a perfect way that their teammate scores. Now, this action in and of itself is also referred to as an assist. It's just a basic passing the ball to your teammate and then they score. But a dime? <laughs> a dime is an impressive assist. Have you ever seen a no-look pass like Sue Bird does? Or have you seen someone throw it all the way down the court and their teammate near the basket gets it and scores? What about a pass so smooth you didn't even see it? And then boom, their teammate is scoring. That's a dime. 
<laughs> now, I know scoring is like the sexy stat line. Everybody wants to know how many points somebody scored in a game. But assists matter, and they can make you just as much of a star or a beloved player on your team. I'm thinking about Courtney Vandersloot, who is now with the New York Liberty. She's such a key player because she gets the ball where it needs to be for her team to score. That gives her a bunch of minutes, even when she's not scoring herself. So if you see a perfect pass that ends in a teammate scoring, that's a dime. Now you know what a dime is. Let me know what other things about basketball y'all need me to break down. Rebound Revolution is an edit audio original podcast created in collaboration with The Cube. I'm your host, Money McEachern, and this episode was produced by Melissa Houghton, Mick Finnegan, and me. It was edited, mixed, and mastered by Mick Finnegan. Our supervising producer is Anna Deshawn. Our executive producer is Steph Colburn. Thank you to Kathleen Speckert and the whole edit audio team.